Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, I think really the, maybe I'll step back and say the reason why um, guidelines uh, are so important right now for atopic dermatitis is just the explosion of new medications. Um, it's, I used in the talk uh, an example, the fact that I finished uh, my training, my fellowship training in uh, the year 2000. And in between more or less then when the topical calcineurin inhibitors, uh, tacrolimus, pemacrolimus were approved, to 2017, when dupilumab was approved, there were actually no uh, new molecules approved for atopic dermatitis. And um, that was in stark contrast during those years to psoriasis, where we would get a new biologic medicine seemingly every other week and just nothing for atopic dermatitis. So for those of us who took care of those patients, it was it was frustrating. And, and to put a finer point on that, before 2017, the only systemic medication that was approved for atopic dermatitis by the FDA was prednisone, which is uh, systemic steroids are our least favorite intervention. And yet they were the only FDA approved treatment. So since 2017, first dupilumab, um, subsequently other biologics like tralokinumab, very soon we hope and think will be another uh, called lebrachizumab, another called nemalizumab, all targeting different aspects of atopic inflammation. Uh, and then uh, small molecules as well, oral JAK inhibitors. Um, Upatacitinib approved down to 12 years of age, Apricitinib approved down to 12 years of age, Baricitinib approved in, in Europe and, and on and on. So um, topicals as well, topical ruxolitinib, lots of new medications, which um, are the reason why uh, an update uh, is, is important, at least from the standpoint of the American Academy, of dermatology. Uh, I was a co-chair of the guidelines in 2014 as well. You know, I just said what, what's happened since 2017 versus before. There was very, very little then in terms of these medications. So high time to update, uh, which we did. Um, also just contrasted um, the American Academy of Dermatology guidelines specifically with a set of guidelines that the uh, American Academy of uh, Asthma and Allergy and their corollary AAAI uh, group uh, put together, um, specifically sort of parsed their guidelines and ours because we used the same system for evaluating the evidence and actually came out with some different recommendations, which I thought was interesting and worthy of Worthy of discussion um, by way of clarification, um, because you know two different sets of guidelines pointing in two different di directions using the same evidence can be a little confusing for for providers for stakeholders, um, and then also sort of frame that against um, guidelines since 2018 from Europe, from Thailand, from Mexico, from Taiwan, from Japan. Just an amazing proliferation of guidelines. So. Um, that was sort of the background, the sort of nuts and bolts, the, the things I really sort of teased out with regard to our guidelines and the allergy guidelines were things like topical ruxolitinib. It, it's one of the newer topical medications. It's a topical JAK inhibitor. We both used the same system of evidence, and yet the American Academy of Dermatology recommended in favor of its use, and the allergy guidelines recommended against. And so the question is, why <laughs> would it come out that way? And it, the big, big difference was uh, part of my discussion was I sort of went through the, the members uh, and the makeup of the guideline committees. And the big point here was that the allergy group had a patient advocate and a patient advocacy group representative, the National Eczema Association. We did not. We did in 2014. We did not. This go around for a variety of reasons, um, legitimate, uh, well considered reasons, but one ones that had consequences. And this was one of them. And the reason they'd, the, the, we, the American Academy of Dermatology recommended in favor was the evidence supported it. Good studies demonstrating safety and efficacy. Great, there you are. Um, the allergy folks saw that same data, but then sort of took in the patient uh, representatives uh, feedback and there's a fairly daunting boxed warning associated with that topical JAK inhibitor. Now, um, that can be parsed, that can be understood, that can be contextualized to, to make it something that's that's reasonable to, to consider and prescribe, but all of that was considered by the allergists and, and their sort of language was a well-informed patient with all of the information available would likely opt not to use this product in favor of others with a different risk benefit ratio, different cost because it's new, more expensive, access could be an issue. So 
that sort of played out on a few different levels. That was the topical roxolitinib, a similar sort of um, calculus with the older non-steroidal immunosuppressants, methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate, cyclosporin. So similar sort of American Academy of Dermatology, yes. Allergy group, no. Um, then things like bleach baths for mild disease. American Academy of Dermatology, yes. Allergy group, no. So that was sort of the gist of the talk, was sort of going through those things point by point. Um, talked a little bit about um, some of the places where it surprised me that that they – the allergy group had a, and there were some members who were on both both groups. Uh, Jonathan Silverberg, who actually runs and develops and and is the head person of the RAD meeting itself, was on both committees. So good folks uh, on both committees, and sometimes the same folks on both committees. But I was surprised in some cases where, uh, because they had that patient voice that had led to those discrepant recommendations we just referenced, that. There were certain places where they, they didn't seem to have a, an alternative recommendation. And one example is with dupilumab, the biologic medication for atopic dermatitis now approved down to six months of age, uh, which is extraordinary. Our site was one of the uh, places of all the age groups for clinical trials. So I had a lot of experience even before this was approved. But one of the challenges that I had as a r researcher was it was really hard to enroll patients in the age group of six months to two years. So two years to six years of age, no problem. But we enrolled zero. And globally in that trial, there were only 11 patients in that two, excuse me, six month to two year age group, six on drug, five on placebo. And yet the FDA still approved it down to that six month indication. So to me, that's very little evidence upon which to approve that medication. And you can sort of look at it two ways. It sort of speaks to the safety profile in the older age groups, but also speaks to the fact that, wow, there's there's not a lot of evidence there upon which we're arresting that recommendation in that very, very youngest segment. So I, I would have imagined maybe the patient represent, representatives and, and the group in the allergy would have seen that and said, you know what, maybe yes, dupilumab for two years of age and older, but not so sure about that younger group. So they didn't. They recommended it just like we did for all approved age groups. So uh, that was just sort of the landscape that I tried to cover in, in my talk, um, parsing these guidelines, and, and I, I hope it was a viable exercise. Yeah, I think mainly so a lot of providers who've taken care of eczema for years um, are used to, you know, another topical steroid coming along, but not much else, and, and that not really advancing the ball significantly. Um, I see that with, I, I'm a pediatric provider, as I said, so I just see kids, but I oftentimes will have chats with the parents who had eczema themselves, since there's a genetic component and there does run in families oftentimes. And and they will not, they get long ago given up on going to dermatologists for their eczema because that was the story. They just got another topical steroid. And then they hear all this stuff that's now available for their kid that they never would have heard if they hadn't brought their kid in because they sort of gave up. So I guess certainly for um, providers who who might themselves have sort of you know I've got my I've got my my standbys for eczema that's what I do that's what's been available that's I presume what's available now maybe realizing that there are some remarkably strong options now that weren't there before and. Yes, they, in some cases, can carry what can potentially be daunting warning labels or be systemic medications for just eczema. Well, number one, kids who are losing sleep two hours a night, getting infections, um, this is the moderate to severe end of the spectrum for eczema is, is not just eczema. So that, that would be message number one is just n n eczema is not, not one size fits all. And then number two, for those kids who really do deserve it, you know, if their eczema gets better with a little Vaseline, of course, um, no one would ever dream of any of these medications, nor would I. But for those who have failed conventional therapy, they don't have a contact allergy, they have the right diagnosis for sure, well, then there's some really new effective medications that can, in the case of, for instance, the oral JAK inhibitors, upadacitinib, start working within a day. Uh, you'll see statistically significant diminution in itch within a day or two, which is just extraordinary. So um, that's probably the take-home messages is, is um, there's a lot of good stuff out there.